I'm always giving all I have in a race, but I guess sometimes you have this like fear that you don't want to blow up or like give too much too soon. So sometimes you hold a little bit back. And I think that was the race because I messed up just at the beginning. I like, I couldn't hold anything back or else I would have been out of the race completely. So yeah, it was interesting because I was like, in my head, I was like, okay, just go all in and stay in as long as you can. Um, yeah, I'd like to be able to tap into that again. And I, I'd like to think that when I'm, you know, at peak fitness and I think I was pretty fit going into Super League, coming off of a big training block at altitude and, you know, doing some speed work and changing things up a bit. Um, I was able to like tap into that. Um, and I, yeah, I really hope I can do it again and dig deep and not, you know, hold anything back in the future. Welcome to the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. We are Jess and BJ, and this is the place where we share stories of people looking, finding, and living their purpose. People who are on the hunt or in the process or experiencing something that is just so true to them. Over the almost 350 episodes of this podcast, we have been blessed to share the mic with professional athletes, doctors, coaches, yogis, and everyday peeps just like us who feel that they have found their thing. By no means do our guests live without challenge, but they may all agree that finding their thing and going after their thing with their whole heart remains a rewarding path nonetheless. A great honor of being a host on this show is that we get to revisit those stories from time to time and reconnect with guests, as in the case of today's episode. Professional triathlete Taylor Spivey was the star of episode 88, which launched in January of 2018. In that episode, we talked about growing up in Redondo Beach, her experience as a surf lifeguard, her start in the sport of triathlon, and the mental game for athletes. In the blog post conclusion, which accompanied the launch of that show, I wrote, expect big things from this girl in the future. I feel an unstoppability about her that is a sign of all great athletes. At the time, she had just walked away from two of her loves, architecture and lifeguarding, to go all in for her professional multi-sport career. She said that she wanted to be consistent in her performances and results. Today, at 31 years old, Taylor is described as one of the most consistent athletes in world triathlon competition. Since our conversation, she has yet to finish further down the ladder than 10th in any WTS race since June of 2018 and is also a major player in the world of Super League triathlon. This year, she took the win on home soil at Super League Malibu and showed us all her surf prowess as she rode a wave like she owned it, propelling herself out of the water in the lead position. To see this woman race is to witness someone who races with her whole heart. Her passion and grit make her a massive threat on race day. She has smashed her goal to be consistent despite great challenges along the way. And we look forward to diving back in with this fierce and ever so lovely professional to see what she has her sights set on for the future. Taylor Spivey, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. It's great to be back. So let's start. There's so many things we want to talk about. (laughs) But first, where are you? What are you doing? And are you taking off season as hard as you were racing the Super League series? (laughs) Right now, I am in Girona, Spain, and I am taking off season very seriously because I've actually been sick for about seven weeks. So I really haven't done anything (laughs) at all. (laughs) But um, yeah, it's not as exciting as a normal off season, but I think my health comes first. And, um, you know, sometimes when you have a really long season and you have a lot of flights and um, you just spend a lot of time on the road, the only thing you want to do is stay in one place. And you were, when we had our conversation in the years ago, you were the the fun adventurer of the group and it must be, I'm sure you're still having adventures um, and we'll get into that, but uh, do you feel a little bit restrained not being able to get out as much as you want? I know you just raced um, not too long ago while you were sick (laughs) and had quite a stellar performance, but do you sort of miss that getting out there? Yeah, I always 
you know, enjoy doing things outside of the sport because I think it's really important to have balance and, um, you know, do things that bring, that make you happy. Um, otherwise, you know, the sport can wear on you. So I'm trying to find that at home right now, which I don't normally get to do because I'm always here training or, you know, packing and unpacking, going from one race to the next. So, um, I'm just trying to adventure at home, which is new and I'm discovering new things to do here and, um, you know, spending time with my friends here and, you know, that's what I need right now. So it's really fun for me. And you're coming off a couple big celebrations with the Royal Wedding, um, Non Stanford and uh, Aaron Royal, which is like, come on, how cool is that? Like who gets to call their wedding the Royal Wedding? Um and that I've also just saw through your Instagram that, you know, you did some hiking and you're, ha- and you're just hanging out with your friends. And these are also fierce competitors. Um, and as somebody who has followed the sport for a long time, I honestly don't know if I've seen like the connection and the support that you women offer each other. I don't think I've seen that in... in um, so blatantly and in such a big way as I have with this generation of really top-notch athletes that you're racing with. And how important is that like support system for you um, as a competitor and, and just as like a, a young professional and woman finding your way in, in the world? I think it's really special to have this support group and it's not something I ever would have expected. I think growing up in competitive sports, you often see your competitors as maybe an enemy or someone you can't be friends with, but I've never really seen it that way. Um, But I think as we've all done the sport for so long um, and, you know, we've gone through a lot of highs and lows together, I think it's really brought us all together And yeah, it's really special. It's really cool to have these people to be there for you when you're, you know, going through something difficult and gosh, sorry, I'm getting teary eyed, but yeah, it's, it's really cool. And I'm so happy I have them. Um, Oh, sorry. It's just Um, this beautiful, like expression of love. Um, And as athletes, you know, it's like, you're so gritty, Taylor. Like you were pretty much the last person I would want to be chased by in this whole world. (laughs) Not that you would ever be chasing me unless I was in a car, but, um, but I mean, it's like this, the competition is so fierce and we're talking seconds, you know, the difference between being on the podium, not being on the podium or winning. And then, there's this connection and this beautiful support system that happens. And then there's like that softness yeah. that perha- perhaps you're feeling right now. And I think if anything, <laughs> it just takes the meter of how much people love you off the charts to, to hear you being raw and vulnerable. Uh, let's see. What are we, eight minutes into the oh, show? Sorry. Oh, gosh, I, I like, love I it. I don't cry in this contest today. Meanwhile, here. Yeah, like, but I think it's really special because – you know, you get on the start line and we're all pretty gritty, you know, like (laughs) you're not doing triathlon if you you don't have quite a bit of grit in you. Um, but you know, the, you get to the finish line and you know, it's over. So we, we kind of just like race our best and, you know, we, dig deep and we're a fierce competitor when the the gun goes off. But when we cross that line, we're there to support each other, whether it's a good result or a bad result or life or anything. Um, And it's cool that I've been able to, you know, train with some pretty incredible people and um, in different training groups and, um, you know, in different training environments. And, um, I've gotten to meet not just the people in my group in the triathlon squad, but I've gotten to 
you know, get a lot closer with girls like Georgia and Sophie and, you know, some of the others um, just through races like Super League and being on the road together. And that's been been really special. And um, I'm fortunate to have, you know, a, a great like core group of friends in the sport. And I hope, you know, our friendship continues to grow um, when we're done with it because it's not going to last forever. It's, it's beautiful to see. I love that they have the cameras that stay on the finish line. It seems as I binge on these shows still all the time, <laughs> you finish and then you go right back to, you're like, you finish and you turn around and you're like waiting for that next person to come in, whether it's Summer or Georgia or Sophie, like you're ready there to greet them or, or Maria um, uh, or Miriam Casillas, yeah. I think it is. Um, but you're so there, you're so ready to just give back, even though maybe you just play second or for like in Malibu, you were just right there ready for them. And I think that bond is super cool. And I, I believe that Super League has afforded this a little bit more because it's not as high pressured as WTS, but it is like it is in the racing, but it, it has this fun element outside of the actual race. Um, do you think that that's helped a little bit? Yeah, I think we all see Super League as kind of more of the, the fun race. Um, there's not as much pressure on us. You know, you're not really racing. You're not racing for your country or to fight for spots or points or whatever. Um, it just doesn't have the same feel and pressure that um, this the World Triathlon Series race has. So we're, we're kind of just on the road together, going from one race to the next and you know, it's a bit chaotic and a bit fun. And, um, some of us have done it for a few years now, but I thought that this year the group was, you know, a really cool group and it was, it just felt like you were, you know, on the road with your friends and just having some fun racing and going out in between, you know, big travel days and, um, getting a little bit of training in and trying to, you know, have some fun in between. We even went to an Ed Sheeran concert together and that was, that was really fun. Um, but it was nice to just do something different because we're just so hyper-focused on triathlon. Um, you kind of forget about having a life sometimes. So yeah, this year Super League was special and I'm glad that I've got to bond with a lot of the people there. I did, I remember that race. You went to the edge. Wasn't it like the night before the race or two nights before the race, the concert? Oh no, I, we went, we went the night of the race, but of the race, they accidentally booked the wrong ticket and she went the night before the race, but she just, we we're like, just watch, she's going to go to this concert and she's just going to have like the best race. And she had one of her best performances. And I was like, typical Jean, like we all knew she was going to pull this off because she's just like, she's such an animal when it comes to racing. And I think she really thrives when she has a bit of fun too. Balance is important. And of, and of course the the only reason we know this, that you guys went to the Ed Sheeran con contest is because of the commentary, uh, you know, between Will and Maka and, um, and we actually just interviewed Will and he's gonna, he's gonna launch, I think two weeks before yours launches. So it hasn't launched yet. And, you know, we, from the first broadcast, we were like, we got to get this guy on the show, you know, and we've been Maka uh, fans for a long time, loves seeing him as a professional racing and and just the new flavor that they were bringing to the commentary booth and just triathlon at large, making it super fun to watch and all of that. And to hear that that doesn't end, you know, with the commentary that you guys are experiencing it too, because this is such high pressure, high, high pressure in a way of like the speed at which this Super League requires you to race super high risk. Like they celebrate the suffering. They, you know, are having you corner on your bike at more than 90 degrees, just like <laughs> crazy stuff. And to hear that, like the, the party of pain 
just is spread throughout all the athletes as well is such a blast. And then constant innovation of how they're shifting it and changing it and making it better every year. And so when we've talked to you back in 2018, like you, you were racing it. And actually I think uh, the picture we used for the podcast was you in your super league uniform. And um, so from that time to now where they were having the eliminator and, and uh, the equalizer and all these different races to how it is now with teens and team captains, um, how is it, how do you like the changes or what do you wish you would see in the future with super league? Um, oh gosh, that is a tough question. Um, I, Super League has definitely evolved over the years, and I think they're still trying to figure it out so that it's less confusing for the public and maybe less confusing for us um, when we're racing. And um, also trying to make it more of like, I don't know, a team dynamic. And, you know, they they have so many ideas um, and they're trying to put it all together, which is really cool. Like, for instance, I think one thing they do well is and then they'll continue to work on is, um, each course is kind of different. It suits a different, uh, strength, um, or yeah, it really highlights some athletes weaknesses. So you'll have like a beach race and then like a hilly race and then a cobble race and, um, all these different formats and different, um, like, styles, like, um, just a different kind of race. And I think that lends itself to, you know, different people, um, you know, winning the event and it becomes more interesting to the public. So I think they're doing a really good job of that. Um, I also like the team dynamic. Uh, it's fun to, it's fun to just not race for yourself. I mean, we are racing for ourselves, but we're also like cheering each other on. So I found, that like when I was in a race with Jean, um, she was just like an animal in the first um, the first round just to get like a short shoot. And then like she would give it to me and I would be like so grateful for her. But then also in the race, I'm like trying to cheer her on and be like, okay, come on, John, like let's do this together. And um, just dynamics like that are really, really fun because you don't usually get that when you're racing other types of races because it's just all about you um and then I found when the men were racing instead of you know cheering for the normal people that you would cheer for you end up cheering for the people on your team because you know the end of the day you're trying to win enough points to you know get the team title we came last but that's okay um but I loved my team and it was a really fun experience and having also having the team manager there was super helpful because there are things that happen on the, in the race because it's so incredibly chaotic, like flat tires or, you know, just setting up your bike in transition really fast or needing a water in between rounds or something like that. And they're right there to help you. So that's also nice. Um, and yeah, overall, I think they're doing a great job. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I can't think of any critiques at the moment, but <laughs> yeah. Well, it's constantly changing it. We had Will on and he was saying there was one race early on where him and Mako were in there and they had to shut down the mics because they're like, everybody's getting eliminated. So we actually have to come up with a rule. And they were like, okay, we're going to have the six rule. Like there oh, can't be yeah, any yeah. <laughs> less than six people. <laughs> so this, this is ever evolving, like, um, and they're doing it on the fly. So I'm glad Jess asked that question because we're getting it from, you know, Will's perspective and, and from the spectator's perspective with us. But you're the athlete in there in the, in the constant changing chaotic energy. I mean, sometimes you have that four minutes to, you know, in between races. Sometimes it's just an ongoing um, getting after it. So it, it's good to hear that feedback. And on the courses, I know Toulouse, I think Toulouse was the one you, you were suited. You were, you really liked that course. It had that hill, um, and the swim was challenging and, and because of the cross current, but Malibu, you absolutely crushed in your hometown. How did that experience feel? Yeah, that was, both of those races were really special to me. Um, I felt like in 
Well, let's see which face was first. So in Malibu, it was really cool because my family was there. You know, my friends were there. I was at home. Like I was only an hour away from where I grew up. So that was, that was really special to me. And I got to race in the surf, you know, and I, I grew up doing surf lifesaving, like we talked about on the last podcast. And it was fun to throw in that dynamic and see if I could try to catch a wave and, you know, play to my strengths. And it ended up working out for me. And I really honestly did not expect to win that day because I felt incredibly jet lagged, but I guess we all felt incredibly jet lagged. And, um, yeah, I was, I was so happy to, to win and, um, also see someone that I train with, you know, every single day. And I did almost every session with this year, Miriam gets second. And then also Georgia, who's a machine, she crashes and gets third. So it's just like, it was really exciting. I and mean, I'm like racing this race and like winning, but I'm also like really happy for everyone around me. Um, it was just a really special experience. And I got to see my family at the finish line and my friends. And yeah, that was such a special feeling. Um, as for Toulouse, Toulouse, I really loved because the fans there were just like the French fans are incredible. They love triathlon. I think because of the French Grand Prix, they're just so invested in the short course racing and following along. And the turnout was incredible. Like I couldn't walk from, you know, the athlete lounge to the start line without having people like want to take photos with me and get signatures. And it was really cute, but I was like, I need to go race. I'll come find you after. Um, but it was cool. Um, I made some incredibly stupid mistakes. I don't know if I like had too much caffeine or what, but I was like, and like I mounted my bike on the cobbles and like fell. I tried to mount my bike on the hill and like my shoes kept spinning out. And I was like last on the first round coming up the hill on the bike. So I made it very difficult for myself. I did not think at all I was going to get like even top 10. And then on the last round, I was like, what? <laughs> I'm uh, in the top like four. <laughs> so that was that was really cool because I think... I made a lot of mistakes, but I really got to channel the energy of all the people there cheering for me. And that was really special too. You had two, I don't want to go into the details of races. I, I love the experiences that you had. I think in Malibu, just watching you take that one backstroke and seeing the wave come and then flipping over and riding the wave with one arm out and, you know, swimming with the other arm and just literally creating so much space between you and that next competitor. And then in Toulouse, you had that amazing swim. You started the swim. I think it was the third swim and you led the whole yeah. swim and it seemed like they were catching up to you behind you, but you just like, man, you did not let it off. <laughs> you led the whole way. You were like, I don't know. You probably shifted into another gear. I want to say. I think I was so frantic after not being able to mount my bike <laughs> that I was like, okay, I need to do everything I possibly can to like make up the time deficit that I lost because I just could not mount my bike for the life of me. Um, and I like felt pretty good that day, um, which is always nice. Um, but I, like when you're swimming, you don't know what's happening behind you. So uh, I do remember turning the second brain, like kind of having a look and I was like, oh, I think it's like actually stretching out. But I was like, okay, I'm just going to keep pushing the pace and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it was two totally different experiences, but they were, they were really fun races. And I think those two are my most memorable. What does it say about the effort you give? Like, you know, sometimes when we're backed into the corner, we have to <laughs> take it that next level up. And and so what did that show you on that, on that swim there where you just, you had to like push, does it, does it, do you foresee in the future possibilities where you can potentially tap into even more, um, fitness available or, or desire or determination, or do you see it as I'm giving all I have all the time and this is what I have? Oh, that's such a tough question. I mean, I'm always giving all I have in a race, but I guess sometimes 
you have this like fear that you don't want to blow up or like give too much too soon. So sometimes you hold a little bit back. And I think that was the race because I messed up just at the beginning. I like, I couldn't hold anything back or else I would have been out of the race completely. So yeah, it was interesting because I was like, in my head, I was like, okay, just go all in and stay in as long as you can. Um, so yeah, I'd like to be able to tap into that again. And I, I'd like to think that when I'm, you know, at peak fitness and I think I was pretty fit going into super league coming off of a big training block at altitude and, you know, doing some speed work and changing things up a bit. Um, I was able to like tap into that. Um, and I, yeah, I really hope I can do it again and dig deep and not, you know, hold anything back in the future. Mm. Where do you find, uh, and this could be training, racing, or just life, like, but where do you find flow? Like, where do you just find that space? Um, I guess really it's of, of no thought, just full engagement. Oh, that's a, there's so many ways I can take this question. Um, I, I would say when I'm training or in races, I generally find flow. Um, especially in races, I'm very focused. Like once I, once we start the race, I'm 100% focused. I know everything that's happening around me. Like even in the swim, I know like whose feet I'm on. I know who's next to me. I know what's happening, like two people in front of me. I'm like very focused and aware. And I just like have this flow, um, like state, I guess, which is really, nice. I'd say it probably doesn't happen every race. Like, you know, when you're having a bad day or you're not feeling great, um, it's hard, to, harder for me to tap into that state. But in general, I, yeah, I get into this zone where I, I know what every, what's happening around me. I'm not really like panicking and I'm just, you know, present. I guess is the best way to describe it. And I, I do also find this in training. Um, and I think probably my favorite flow state is when I'm just like on a run and just, you know, it's kind of like Zen to me and I like to run by myself and just do an easy, easy jog. And yeah, I, I find it very like peaceful and almost like meditative. Do you ever have trouble getting out the door? All the time. All the time. <laughs> I am the oh, good. Worst. That is like the yeah, best answer. Yes. So how do you get out the door? I am I'm so bad at starting things. But like once I start, I'm fine. It's just like, yeah, getting out the door, I am not very good at. It. Um it's taken me a while to figure that out. And I don't think I've totally figured it out. But I think meeting up with people or like meeting up with people 100% gets me out the door because I have to be there at a certain time and they hold me accountable. And I really relied on that a lot this year because I was struggling <laughs> to just, you know, get going um, for many reasons. And um, it was really nice to have, you know, a teammate like Miriam where we were coming back from injuries together and we were doing totally different sessions than the rest of the group. And we would just, meet and start the session together and it helped a lot. Yeah. I'd say that's my, my go-to when no one's around, I really do struggle. I need to find a better way to do that. Maybe like write down a schedule for the day and a time and just stick to it. But you know, I think we all procrastinate and find other things. Do you talk to yourself? Like, come on, Taylor, (laughs) like get the bike. Like, let's go. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. I definitely do that. And then sometimes I think I, I'll be like, oh, but like, I need to clean like the kitchen first, you know, or like, oh, I should go take the laundry out of the machine and hang it up. And then I'm like, oh God, okay. It's like 30 minutes past when I was going to start. Let's get going. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So you're human. That's so beautiful. And I think we all struggle with that to a degree. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
yeah, I think meeting up with people, having that accountability is awesome. Like when we know we're meeting the team at 7 a.m. at the rail trail, I mean, we still typically show up around 7.05 now, but... Um, we're getting we're, better. We're getting yeah, better. We're late uh, <laughs> to the event that we create, um, but people are very forgiving, thank goodness. And um, But it does, it gets you out the door. It's like, I've made this commitment to these people, like I have to be there. Um, where do you find like... Where do you find flow outside of sport? And and the thing that's coming to mind is I remember when we were talking years ago, you had just kind of left ar- architecture behind and things like that. But we were talking about like sketching and are you still doing any of that or any activities outside of it? And, you know, also like you might just be focused on triathlon and that's a fine answer too. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really good question. Because I think I'm struggling with balance right now and I have been for a while. So it like my life has been so triathlon focused um, the last few years that I've kind of lost touch with other things that make me happy. Um, so I'm trying to get back to that now. I, I don't know if it's necessarily like a flow state, but I try, I'm trying to like go meet up with some non traff on friends sometimes if I'm, you know, here in Girona or just do things with other people or go have, you know, a lunch with someone. And, you know, when I'm training a lot, I, I don't have time for these things. And it might sound weird to like the average person, but I'm just so tired and like, I want to rest, but I, I do also get a lot from, you know, being around people that make me happy. And I've done a lot better job of of that this year. And I think, um, even though I'm a bit introverted, I think I'm finally kind of like learning to be a bit more social and it's not exhausting to me. It's actually, you know, I'm getting something from it now because I've, you know, kind of forced myself to do this and, um, yeah, it makes me happy. Another thing that I would like to go back to, which I haven't done in a long time is like sketching and drawing. So that's one of my off-season, pre-season goals. Yeah. Okay. With the, with this focus of, you know, getting back to a sense of balance, more so now because you've got Paris. I'm assuming Paris is, you know, 2024 is, is the priority. I, I'll let you speak to that, but do you feel like there's a sense of like, I want to get, I want to get some things in for me first because I know what it's going to, involved when I, when I finally just get into the motion and set my eyes on that, on that build into what I need to do to qualify? Yeah, I, yeah, I really think that, you know, the build up to the last Olympic cycle was very stressful and especially with COVID, it just made it, I mean, it was longer and, um, I didn't have that balance. And I find that when I take a longer off season, like I did this last year, or I be more, I'm become more social in just like, you know, small moments of, of a week or something like that. I actually feel like I have more longevity and I can, I'm less burnt out when, you know, the important races come around or when, you know, I have to perform later on in the year. Um, I think you see that with a lot of athletes. Some people don't take very long breaks in the off season. It'll be like two weeks and then they go right back into training. And for me personally, I need longer. And I mean, I'm still active and I'm still maybe just doing something or like fun with a friend, like I'll go on a hike with Georgia or something like that. But um, for me, I need a bit longer because mentally the season is so long if you think about it most of us train every single day except for like maybe a flight or if you're sick or you know that's pretty much it and to only have two weeks off is kind of crazy um like you need a break to be able to perform and a lot of people can perform at a few races at the beginning of the year and then at the end of the year you know they're just totally cooked um with that said, I am very sick right now, but I think that's because I did race like 
eight races in like three months. So <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah. I felt like that last race at Abu Dhabi, like people were just tired. Yeah. I was like, everybody just seems <laughs> so tired to me. Even like, on the men's side just too. Tired just tired like, or like fighting a cold or anything, which probably the whole leveled the playing field yeah. a little bit. But I was like, I just had this feel like this energy of like, everybody's just tired. <laughs> like when we got, when we stood on the, the start line, we were just like, last one, finally. <laughs> <laughs> Like, hope we make it to the end. <laughs> and, like, I'm um, saying people I did Super League with, so we're just like, oh, this is so familiar because we've literally raced every weekend <laughs> almost. So, yeah, it was it was funny. But, yeah, we were yeah. all very tired. I think I can speak for most of them. It was – the season was too long this year, for sure. I mean, it was, like, what, two months longer than normal? Mm. It finished two months later than it normally would. So I'm glad that next – year we're finally back on more of a normal schedule. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, leading into Paris qualifications and, um, towards the Olympics, you know, despite being ranked second in the world, you were not selected for the Olympics, which I know from what I have read and heard uh, from different interviews, little short clips that you've done, you gave everything to get to that Olympics and it didn't happen. Um, reflecting back, what was your pro- what was that process in letting go of that? Like meaning anger, sadness. Like there's there, I would assume there's like a grief, like a mourning, a letting go. Um is there still any resonance of that? And can you use that as fire moving forward? Um, yeah, that was definitely a tough um, year for me. I think, I think that, you know, I didn't like, I didn't feel like I, deserved the spot, but I felt like I had earned it. And I felt like if COVID hadn't have happened, I was 100% on that team. And so just the way things played out, I kind of just, I was frustrated and I, I, I mean, it's, it's no, no other athlete's fault. It's, you know, it's just kind of the way, you know, COVID changed things and how criteria was written to not really complement that and kind of be in the best interest of the athletes, just in my mind personally, um, because it was a stressful period for all of us. Um, and, you know, it just prolonged the qualification period. Um, and I think some countries did a good job of dealing with that and, you know, others didn't. But yeah, the grieving process was difficult. I was, you know, not very happy. I was also pushing an injury to its limit and, you know, training through something that was kind of causing me pain. And there were a lot of things and I kind of lost the fun and the joy in the sport. Um, so yeah, after the selection was announced, I mean, I kind of thought it might go one way, but I wasn't totally sure, but I was really, really upset. And I took a few days off and just kind of isolated myself. And I was, you know, really, you know, down. Um, and after that we had to still race. And, um, I think I was, part of me wanted to like prove them wrong, but part of me just wanted it to all be done. (laughs) And like, I just wanted a break and I wanted to like run away from it all. So, um, yeah, when it came to super league last year, I was pretty just like over it. I wanted to not race. I just wanted to, you know, escape and go on a vacation somewhere and, and, um, deal with my foot injury that has still been bothering me. And so it just seemed very drawn out and it was a difficult process for me to deal with. And that's why I went into this year, um, 
I tried to have a different mindset, at least when it came to the Super League races. I was just, you know, there to have fun. And and even the training that led into that race, I was just, you know, we were trying different training and doing more speed work with my teammates. And it just felt different and it felt more fun. And I was just trying to find the joy in it again. And I think with that, I had some, you know, good results. And I think, you know, happiness or finding joy in the sport goes a long way. Um, yeah. And can we really renew our joy and gratitude for what we do if we don't feel, you know, the rock bottom of disappointment in the very sport that we were finding the joy, right? Like if we don't know the dark, then we don't know the light. And um, is there like a fire in your belly moving into Paris? Is that even a goal? We're just we're just yeah, making we're just assumptions over here. <laughs> um, that's, I mean, I've never made an Olympic team, so that's a big goal of mine. But I think I'm. I guess part of me feels a lot of pressure because I didn't make the last one. And this is kind of like, you know, I'm nearing the end of my career. I wouldn't say I'm there yet, but you know, it's, it's coming. (laughs) And I'd like to make an Olympic team. I think it's just really special. Um, Sometimes I'm torn because I think there's a lot of weight put on this one race, but then this other part of me is like, oh, there's so much, you know, history behind this this race too so yeah I don't think I'm going into Paris 2024 um selection with the same like um stress (laughs) I think I'm a bit more relaxed and and whatever happens happens but also there'll definitely be a part of me that really, really wants it deep down inside. Um, but I think I just, I think I've gotten to a point where I just set my expectations of myself so low that that way I'm not disappointed, <laughs> which is kind of silly to say and do. But yeah, I guess I've been disappointed quite a bit. So maybe that's why I do it. I don't know. Doesn't doesn't that set you up for success more? You know, you're, you're setting yourself up for more successes. Not, not to say you're self sabotage like you're not setting yourself up like, you know, I'm going to, I'm probably going to finish the race, but then you end up like fourth, like there's a setup of like, and Michael Phelps talks about it too. Like many small wins. Like if you continually get many small wins, small wins, small wins, they keep stacking up and you build momentum. So when we put, too much attachment on these things that are just are just so high and important and we were attached to it we create that stress and anxiety but when we actually maybe reframe it to have a different perspective which sounds like you've done in a in a game that you're playing with yourself like i'm just going to set my expectations a little bit lower that is my goal to get to the olympics and it's not like you're going to try any less or not you know, do all the intervals in the workout and give your best. But there's a sense of like, that's what I'm working towards, but I'm not solely attached to the outcome of how it has to happen. There's a lot of trust and belief in myself as the athlete that I am today that I've, that I've created. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, that comes with like small successes and, you know, um, just doing little things every day or, meeting certain goals every race or, you know, setting these achievable objectives instead of this like grandiose um, idea that's almost unattainable or feels so, so far away that puts so much more stress on yourself. And I see a lot of athletes who get to races and they're just like a shell of themselves and they, they train so well. They're incredible athletes in training, but when it comes to the race, they just can't perform. So, um, I never really saw it as a mental tactic. I think I just saw it as like, maybe me not being super confident in myself or not wanting to disappoint myself. Um, 
But at the end of the day, yeah, I'm never giving any less. I mean, I'm tough in training. I'm really consistent in training. I show up every day. I do usually the high end of our reps. You know, I, I give everything my 100%. Um, but I, yeah, maybe I always surprise myself because I have these, you know, small objectives along the way, which is, I guess, a good thing. I don't know. I'd like well, to, have I mean, I feel so. <laughs> What's that? I'd like to have more confidence, but I think that's just, that's just who I am. Yeah. Well, I can't tell you how many people we've had on the show, professional athletes and age groupers too, like somebody going for Kona, you know, well, I guess I can't really call it Kona anymore no, with, the up, with the uproar yeah. about locations <laughs> and stuff. So it's so funny how uh, that's so habitual about, and actually even Ben Canute, like we just interviewed Ben the day after he did Ironman Arizona and he was talking about um, how at the beginning of a season, he was just like underperforming and it was just like, you know, and they got on slow twitch and everyone's like, you know, 10 things that Ben Canute's doing wrong. And, you know, all these things, just like all the chatter and everything. And he kind of went into, um, I ran in Arizona, like, fuck it. <laughs> like yeah. just, you know, like it, and, and how many times I've heard the story of people coming off of like basically what their worst case scenario is. Like you didn't get to the Olympics. Like you've already experienced the worst case scenario. And then there's this pressure that gets lifted. And from the from the rubble of the disaster, like there's a freedom. Yeah, yeah. I think then when you don't have an expectation on yourself, sometimes you perform to how you, I think, are supposed to perform, you know, but that pressure sometimes just messes with you. Um, yeah. And I'm sure Ben went through that. And I can say that like, for instance, a personal experience I had with that, I mean, outside of the Olympic selection was I think in Abu Dhabi 2019, I crashed my bike like two days before the race. I slid out and I had like a big hematoma on my hip. And I was just like, okay, the race is done. Like, I don't care. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not expecting much for myself. And then I race and I get second. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> How is this even possible? Um, and I think I had a few of those this year too, but I was sick. So I was like, oh, I'm sick. Like there's a 50, 50 chance I'm going to finish Bermuda or Abu, in Abu Dhabi. I was like, there's a 20% chance I'm going to finish this race. I have a sinus infection and pneumonia. Like what the heck? But yeah, somehow, you know, when you just have these low expectations of yourself, I guess, you know, that pressure is lifted. And even if you're sick. I don't, re I don't recommend, I'm not encouraging racing when you're really sick, but I felt I wanted to, and I felt like I was okay enough to. So, um, and I was ready to stop at any point. Um, but yeah, that pressure is lifted and it, it, it goes a long way. Like your headspace is, is incredibly important when it comes to racing. Mm, yeah. I think confidence, you know, I, myself growing up, I wasn't very confident playing basketball and I wish I could go back, you know, and play with the mind that I have now because it's exactly that. I didn't, I, I cared too much about it in the way that it all played out and I didn't have enough fun or joy with it or experience with it, like actually experiencing it. And I think, I think the more experience you, you continue to gain, the, the more momentum you're building. And this universe is really funny sometimes, right? And it's, it's asking you, it's asking us as athletes to just keep showing up. And it's exactly what you're doing because you can't give yourself a chance, let's just say, to be at the top of the podium if you're not actually out there in the race performing well based on how much training you've done and, and effort that you've put in there. So the universe is like, this person keeps showing up and they're consistent. And all your results last year, like you're, you're like knocking on the, you're, you're, you're <laughs> knocking on the door constantly, like almost every race you're there. Well, and I'm that to me. <laughs> <laughs> we got, we got to stop saying, we can't yeah, say we can't that say anymore. That. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. 
I guess it's I, know, like, I was on the podium, so that's okay. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm very much knocking on the door of the podium. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's just ev- that's the evidence, right? If we need evidence, and the mind likes evidence, the athletes we like to see evidence. We like to look at the watch and see the times and the proof. But if you take it at a, at a bigger scale, if you look at it really high up, you look down and you say like, wow, they're just like consistently year after year after year after year. The mind would want to say, well, when, when, like, tell yeah. me when. Um, but that's kind of none of our business. It's, it's, it's really about tugging upon that thread that this is what I'm meant to do. This is what I love to do. This is my purpose right now. And I'm going to continue to give everything I have, have fun with it. We leave some of the pressure and let's just see what happens. Let's just see what unfolds and watch this. More often than not, I see that happen with athletes that I coach that everything that they desire and even more just falls into their lap. More so when they detach from, you know, detach from a timeline or a tight grip on, on how things have to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, does that resonate? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you hold on too tightly to something, you know, um, I don't know what the saying is, but you need to let things go sometimes and see if they, they come back to you. But I think one, I guess, analogy that I always like to, um, like think about a reference when, you know, people are just like some of the younger athletes I train with, or, you know, some people ask me questions about like, oh, like, why am I not performing right now? And like, they just think they can go from like, the bottom to the top. And like, for instance, if you have a ladder, like you can't go to the, from the bottom to the top, if you don't have all the steps in between, you know, and, you know, little by little, you have to climb that ladder. And if you jump to the top step, usually it doesn't last very long or you go right back down to the bottom. And, you know, you see that often when someone has like a one-off performance, but, um, the rest of us, I think, you know, are just chipping away and, I think I'm a good example of of that. I I was never like an incredible athlete when I was younger. Like I was good and I always worked a lot harder than everyone else, but it's taken a really long time for me to get to, you know, a world-class level where I'm, you know, fighting for maybe a podium or a win one day. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and you're not competing against a bunch of like nobodies. Like you're com- – like the – just the U S alone, the competition that you, that you are in is, you know, best of the best. And that represents you as well. Like that's a reflection of you. And then you take that to the world stage and you have somebody like Georgia Taylor Brown who just, you know, it's like, Oh my God, the girl is, is amazing. And I say the same thing about you. Just so amazing. Like just getting after it. And so it's, you have a lot of momentum and it's that's not something that's going to show up on your watch and it's not going to show up like your your sponsors can't calculate a dollar amount with momentum like momentum is something that you can't see um but there's evidence in just the years of your performances and and showing up and that momentum as long as you keep moving it forward And you're at a point where you're in the slipstream of it, like it's not going to continue. It has to continue to expand. It has to continue to expand. If you just keep going and you keep showing up and, you know, making those dates with your teammates to go train so you get out the door, um, that momentum is going to continue to carry you. You're the work in in the mind, and this is for me and for BJ and for you and for everyone is staying focused on on what we want without a kung fu grip about when and how it's got to play out. And I think that is like, that's the finesse of life that takes so many years to, and so many failures and many, many wins to figure out. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's by no means like a linear process it's you know it undulates but it's trending in the upward progression it's like the rule of what a hundred thousand hours or something like that (laughs) like 
it takes time. You're not going to master something in a day or, you know, in a few years, it takes a lot of time and I'm still learning and still making mistakes and still finding, you know, better ways, uh, to trade and, uh, you know, work with my coach and, you know, adapt things and evolve as, as an athlete and find balance outside of the sport to then bring me, you know, more joy in the sport. And I think, you know, it's, we're all evolving and hopefully for the better. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. Coming off of this year though, like we taught, you touched upon confidence and, you know, maybe that's just the way I am. Um, but do you garner even more confidence from this year or is that still, you know, that internal battle that we all really battle with? It's, um, not pointing you out, but, um, but to hear it, um, from you, like, what do you pull away from this 2022 season that bolsters confidence moving forward? I think for me, it's that I can perform under any condition that is thrown at me. Like I can rise to the occasion and it may not be, you know, my best, but I can still rise to it. And this year has shown like been like a perfect display of that to me because there have been so many races this year. I was just like, I've never felt this way. And my teammates are so tired of me hearing of hearing me say this, but I was just like, I don't know if I'm going to finish this race. Like I'm really sick or like, I'm just not in a good place right now. And because of like them and their support and like me just like not wanting to give up. Um, I, you know, was able to perform and I know like triathlon and performances and everything, but, um, I think also these like relationships that I've really developed outside of the sport with people in the sport this year have also helped me, um, you know, maintain that momentum and be able to draw from it and, you know, perform in races too. So, yeah. Yeah, I have no doubt. De- like when I watch these races, it's no matter what the challenge, I know that it doesn't, I don't know how long it's going to take, but Taylor's going to be at the front of the bike at some point. Like, I just know that's going to happen, right? It, it's just, and if I believe it and I share it, then other people believe it and share it. And then it's like this whole thing, like Taylor, she's a great bike cyclist. Like there's no way she's not going to make it to the front pack, right? And so, and then this gets back to you and you're like, yeah, like, yeah, this is awesome. I love this. <laughs> I'll let your like your TV screen a little more, and then I can like you know feel it from the camera guy. <laughs> I'm screaming at. You. We're always yeah. sending it to you. But I, I love that because it just builds it builds story story story, and then you start hearing commentators talk about it like, oh, Taylor's run is great this year. She's always running and finishing like that. That momentum is is really powerful, and I don't know how often you go back and watch these races. Um, but if you hear the if you hear the dialogue, it's it's momentum building. There, it's never like a lack. It's always a it's always a, a an abundance. Yeah, I don't. I sometimes I'll rewatch the races when I want to see like certain things that play out because I'm like, what happened here? I have no idea. Um, but usually, I actually I should watch the races more. I know this, but I don't watch the race until like the morning of that race the next year, if that makes sense. Like I'm like getting ready. I'm like braiding my hair and I'm watching the race from the year before to like try to get like, you know, some adrenaline going or like get pumped up, which is kind of silly. But, um, (laughs) I'm like, like, okay, I'm not going to make this mistake, uh, this time, you know, I'm just like, kind of like cramming in my homework, (laughs) but, um, like, yeah, it's it's funny because sometimes I I won't hear the commentators um, until like the morning before next year's race unless someone tells me like oh like so and so said this or or Will said this or whatever. Um, but yeah, in terms of of momentum, it's it's cool to see like that I'm not just a swimmer anymore, not just a swim biker anymore. I'm also a runner, and I know I'm not. You know, sometimes I'm 
not so great in the swim, but I like make up for it on the bike and the run. And I'm, I'm still figuring out how to balance it all in, in training and off of eight races in a row. But um, at the end of the day, we're triathletes and, you know, it's about swim, bike and run and who can do that the best. And, um, and with that idea in my mind, I think, you know, I'm become a pretty good triathlete and, um, I know I can be a bit better and I hope I, I can finally take a win, you know, next year, very soon. Um, and I'm doing my best to just trust the process and put in the, the work every day and, and not put too much pressure on myself. How aware are you of the PTO and, and, and seeing athletes like jumping up a little bit into 70.3 and then coming back or Taylor, is that something you've come into your awareness or is that not, um, is that not there yet? I know I can perform at that level, like without a doubt. And I just haven't had given myself a chance to, because I was focused on super league and I performed well there, but it would be really fun to do a PTO race. And I think I want to do one. Well, we'll see next year because next year is an important year with qualification, but I really would like to, you know, just dabble in that and see what it's like. Um, I know what courses would suit me and not suit me, but in, at the end of the day, I need to get on a time trial bike and, and I don't want to show up at a race when I haven't like spent a bit of time in that position because, um, yeah, it's a different, it's a different sport. Like you have to respect the other sports, like we're all doing triathlon, right? But they're different. You don't have, you know, long course athletes really coming down to super league and, and, you know, you're training for one type of racing and one style of racing. And, and I need to give it the respect it deserves. Um, but I do think it translates to, you know, some of my strengths if I pick the right course and, and I think I could, you know, do really well at it. Like you see Taylor Nibs like crushing it and, and Flora's doing really well and she's finding her way. And, um, Paula came from short course racing and, Mm -hmm. you know, she's thriving. So it's, yeah, I'm, I'm racing and competing with uh, quite a few people who are, you know, dabbling in world triathlon and PTO, whereas right now I'm dabbling in super league and world triathlon, but yeah, I'd like to mix it up, but I need to get on time trial bike first. <laughs> that was a very yeah, long answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, long course athletes don't come down to Super League because they know they have no business going to Super League. <laughs> That's how they first had it. Wasn't were, Cam Worf they were in inviting um, them early Malibu? On. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, Cam Worf was. She's a pro cyclist. Like, I know, but he was like out there swimming alone. Will's <laughs> like, oh boy, here's Cam's like swimming alone out there. Um, but I'm loving the confidence that I'm hearing in your yeah, voice. Yeah, no doubt. There was no doubt. Yeah, love that. Um, so awesome, Taylor. Thank you so much for, I you know you don't even feel good and you're here you are um, coming to us from Girona, Spain. We so appreciate you and we are always sending you just so much success and love and support and we love watching you race and um you know until next time uh if you would grace us with your appearance somewhere down the road to come back on the show but we'll continue to follow you and just thank you so much for your time today yeah you're welcome it's always a pleasure talking to you guys i love your questions in the chat so thanks for having me again (laughs) absolutely thank you bye